Uh, look, everyone, thank you very much for coming um, to the field day today and thank you for coming down to Paddock 23. Uh, Sarah, George and the LLS team have done a great job pulling on today. But I'd just like to acknowledge um, Mark and Pete. Can you put your hands up, please, guys? Give a wave. Um, they were drivers. So, um, yeah, look, thanks to both the guys. Um, they're responsible for making this area that we're working in as clean and tidy um, as it is. All right, so um, I've been talking about Desmanthus and been working on Desmanthus now for a number of years. Uh, from what you were saying to Sean in answer, response to Sean's question, um, at least well, over half of you have actually been here before, so you've probably heard me talking about Desmanthus. I guess um, the, more, the longer we're playing with it, the more we understand and get a better understanding of its potential as a legume in our environment. And um, yeah, look, it's all looking very positive. So today I basically just want to run through um, Desmanthus, uh, give you a bit of an idea um, about some of its characteristics and um, yeah, and then answer any questions. So um, Desmanthus is a tropical legume. So it grows at the same time as our tropical grasses. Now that has a number of advantages um, and disadvantages. I suppose the disadvantage is that you're not actually getting any winter production from your from your tropical pasture because there's nothing growing over that winter period. So desmanthus, like the grass, just stops growing. Um, in the case of desmanthus, it actually drops all its leaf and you just end up with, uh, with the stems, dead stems. Uh, and then it, in, uh, depending, depending on, the, on the spring, sort of September, October, it tends to start to regrow and um, produces new stems. So it grows from the crown, similar to what, you know, lucerne does and all the rest of it. So it's, it's very similar to lucerne, I suppose, to look at. This is Desmanthus here. This is actually cultivar Mark. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice, very nice one. And I'll go through some of the cultivars that, we've, um, that are commercially available um, shortly. So it's a perennial tropical legume. Um, it's actually native to, to the Americas, so North, Central and Southern America, and also in the Caribbean. So it likes, you know, it likes rainfall. It can handle, handle the cold as well. Um, it's a pretty widely adapted little legume. So in our environment, um, well, it's, it's, germpasm has been collected from a, a wide range of different soil types. But we've found that in, um, well, in Australia, it's probably best suited, all the varieties that we have available are best suited to those, um, to those heavy, um, heavier soils, so the clay soils um, with um, sort of neutral to alkaline pH. But um, it has been very successfully grown on some of the more acid soils as well. So there was some work done on Gilgandra and it went, um, it was uh, pH calcium chloride down to 5.1 but I think that was seriously pushing its boundaries. So, um, so anything from a six above is probably about where, you know, where you might be, might be looking for it, be able to put this, um, put this little legume. Now, um, you'd want to be looking at an area where you have an annual um, average rainfall of around 550 mils, um, preferably with a bit of summer dominance because obviously that's when it's growing. But um, I've been working with Sean for a long time now. Um, and, um, and I suppose the, dis the, the advantage of um, you've got your legume and your grass growing at the same time of year, the, the, the other advantage of that is you're actually storing soil moisture over that winter period, which then kickstarts um, both your, your grass and your legume pasture, which is, which is nice for that over that spring, that um, early part of the growing season. Now it's very drought tolerant. Um, in the literature, it talks about being drought tolerant. Um, we've had um, lines which have actually come through the drought um, out at um, experiments at both Bingra and also Manila and Colivar Mark, so this guy, and also JCU2. Um, um, and I don't know whether you saw it or not, as you head out on the buses on the right-hand side, there's a sign uh, just in the paddock next to the laneway. Um, there's a small section of JCU2 and digigrass there as well. So it's, it's another, another, another one of the cultivars and they've both shown to be um, extremely persistent of, of the ones that we were testing. Um, it's rhizobia specific, which sort of makes it similar to a lot of the other legumes that, that we work on. Um, this one actually requires CB3126. Now, um, you know, it's, it's not, we use it on the only other, the only other legume that that particular rhizobia is used on is actually Latina. So um, it, depending on where you are, you may actually need to ask your local um, seed supplier or um, 
you know, Elders, Landmark, wherever you like to shop, um, ask them to get it in. Uh, we actually got ours from Elders in town. Um, so yeah, so they, they are stocking it um, locally. Now, one of these things about this legume is that it has very high hard seed, leg, um, hard seed levels. So that means that when you buy seed, um, it's really important that you check to make sure that it is scarified because if you sow unscarified seed, nothing will come out of the ground. So we've done some work here where we, uh, we put some um, seed on the ground of a number of, of well actually it was two varieties, uh, Mark and also JCU2 again. Um, I've been playing with those two quite a bit over the last few years. And um, after 12 months, both of them had you know, 80, 90% uh, hard seed. So basically they didn't break down, very little breaks, hard seed breakdown over that first 12 months. And after three years, Mark still had 77% hard seed in the seed bank. So it's a prolific seeder. It'll scent a lot of seed, but it also has a very hard seed um, breakdown. JCU2 breaks, breaks down a lot quicker. So after three years, it had dropped back down to about 6% hard seed. So we broke down much faster. But um, again, it's about maintaining that seed bank. Now, um, I said it was a perennial. It is a perennial, but it's a short-term perennial. So which... So um, plants generally uh, probably tend to last around three to four years and then they will die. So this is where the hard seed or the seed bank comes into play because it's actually really important for establishing new plants and getting that population going, ticking over and having some new recruitments all the time. And, and it can be, you can actually manage that within a grazing system. So, um, hmm. Uh, now, protein, quality. Um, these guys are really, really good quality. So the, the, leaf, the leaf on them is similar to Lucent. The stem of, so um, our stem of Mark is finer than some of the others, so um, it's probably pretty similar to Lucent. But um, of some of the more woody ones, they, um, they see their, the protein or the quality of their, their, um, their stem is not as good. Um, but it's highly palatable. Both sheep and cattle love it. We'll, we'll lick it, lick it clean. Um, once it starts getting too woody, the sheep probably don't, well, they don't like to eat the stem. So they will, they will just lick the leaf off it and just eat the small stem. But, you know, sheep would have no problem with that at the moment at all. So um, just some numbers. So the crude protein of Desmanthus uh, range, say, 10 to 20%, while Lucent, as a comparison, range 12 to 24. Now, that's on a whole of plant basis. So that's not, that's pretty comparable. Uh, when you look at metabolizable energy, uh, Desmanthus was 6.5 to 7.3, while the um, while Lucent was 8 to 10, and that's where that stem really came into play. One of the things I really like about this legume is that it is non-bloating. Well, you know, Lucent, Lucent, we've got to be very careful of. Um, these guys are not, and that's part. part the reason for this is because um, they've got tannins in in them. But unlike some others, some other species um, that do have tannins, um, this one is still really, really highly palatable and, and stock still love it to the point where they'll actually selectively graze it in a mixed pasture. So there are no, so it hasn't, the tannin levels do not affect um, the, um, the palatability, nor do they have any implications for animal production, which is positive. Now the second, the second thing, the advantage of these tannins is that they're actually reported to be anti-methanogenic. So in the current environment where, where livestock systems or livestock or agriculture as a, as, a, as a whole is under the spotlight for our emissions, um, these guys have actually got a potential role to play or in other legumes like this in actually helping us address some of that and reduce some of that methane. So we are, we have, we're hoping to kickstart a new project next year. Um, some of the team members are here, um, where we're actually going to be looking at Desmanthus as one of these legumes to, um, to actually see what, what its role might be in that. And also a, a, a broad range of other legumes, um, including temperate, aiming to try and improve that productivity, the overall quality of, of the pasture, so that we can turn stock off quicker, move it through, move the feed through the room and quicker and actually reduce our emissions. So yeah, there's, there's new work starting on that very soon. The, um, um, with regards to the, um, the methane, its ability to reduce methane, 
There was some work done, uh, it, was, it was a feeding study, so a pen study done by CSIRO, um, where they actually, uh, Desmanthus, I don't think it was this, entry, this, I don't think it was this cultivar, um, Desmanthus at 30% of the diet actually reduced methane by 10%. So, yeah, so it's, you know, there's, we're, we're, going, we're interested in doing some work looking at sheep as well um, to, to see, see what it is in sheep. But those sort of numbers are, you know, well, something that we need to need to keep in mind um, as as our industry gets more and more in the spotlight. Now, um, it's not. This is not a really super highly productive legume. Um, it's not lucerne, but unlike lucerne, um, you know, it doesn't cause bloat, and you can actually keep it in a pasture longer term instead of hopefully having to re-sow it which you have to do with lucerne. But you know, it's not as productive as lucerne. So, um, in, a, so um, in some of the earlier work we did, we were looking at say three to four tonne it was producing over that summer period um, in a mixed pasture. And um, in some of the, during the drought, uh, we had some mixed pastures as well. So that was uh, desmanthus with digit grass and it was producing one to two tonne over the drought period. So, you know, so it's, it's, not, it's not super productive, but it is, it is going to be there and it is highly palatable. Now herbicides, so one thing I regularly get asked when I start talking about desmanthus. Um, we've, done, we've done a number of studies now, um, looking at um, a range of different options. Uh, the, the data is with the biometrician at the moment. So I don't actually have, I cannot say that we've got permits that you can actually um, spray um, desmanthus with at the moment, but um, I've um, I have I can give you a few different notes if you like. Um, by all means, well, avoid at all costs 2,4-D, 2,4-DB, dicamba, MCPA, and MCPB, and also stay away from dual gold as a um, as a pre-emergent. Um, we have had some success, and again, this is not a recommendation, I'm not allowed to give recommendations, but we have had success with bromoxynol, um, uh, trifluralin, oh, paraquat, paraquat was good um, on, um, if you had some seedling weeds coming through, and also spinnaker was the other one that we've also had some success with. Now, mind you, they're not recommendations, and I hope any managers are here. I've got their ears blocked. All right. Now, there are four commercial, there are four cultivars which are currently available. I think previously, when we've been talking about this, it's often been one, maybe two, that um, you know, as as they come up. And it, the, the fact that there are now four cultivars um, just goes to show that um, seed companies actually see that there's potential in this species as well. So Mark is this one, it's, um, it's now a public variety, so you can buy it from a range of different seed companies. Um, it is, it's probably the earliest flowering of, of all of them, of all the cultivars which are available. And it, um, it um, is very fine stemmed, as you can see, as you can see here. Um, and it's, yeah, look, it's, it's really nice. It has really, really high, it's prolific cedar and has extremely high hard seed levels, which is not a problem once you've got a seed bank. So you want to be trying to have it set seed every, you know, something like this, probably every two years or so, so that you're actually maintaining that seed bank. And you've always got some new hard seed coming into the, coming into the seed bank while you've got others germinating. And then, then and then you've actually got this trickle of seed or this seedling regeneration through time. Uh, the second one um, is Progardis. Now, um, the guys at UNE, Jono is going to be speaking next. Um, they've been working with some of the individual entries um, which make up Progardis. So Progardis is actually a mix of um, a range of cultivars. So they call, all their lines are, are JCU for James Cook University and they have um, nine of them. So JCU one through to JCU nine. Um, I've worked pretty, we worked with uh, JCU one through to five. Um, they've had these other ones come online since. Um, of those, um, and they are, they're, they're actually from three or four different species. Now, the ones that most of the commercial cultivars are actually Desmanthus vergatus, which is what this guy is. But um, the Agrimix group, they've actually got a number of other different species in there. Which, um, which, which are, are also, also 
well, I haven't used all of them, but um, the, the idea is that they've got a range of them for different environments. So um, Agrimix, um, their, their cultivar is called Progardis, and it is usually a, com a, a combination or a mix of a range of different varieties of those JCU varieties. Now, um, if you are going for Progardis, and it is, it, is a good, it is a good cultivar, just make sure it's got plenty of JCU2 in it because our, our work has shown that JCU2 is, um, is the best of the ones that we've tried. Um, they have got some newer ones um, that, have, that have now been developed and I think there's more, more that they're hoping to push through. Um, some of them are longer season, um, which is probably not great for environment. We need something which is shorter season. So NJCU2 is that. Uh, now the third one is Ray. So Ray's only been out for a couple of years. Ray is available through Barrenbrug um, and it is available locally in town. I think elders are selling it at least. Um, it is, it's also, it's a Vagardus like this one. It is finest, it is fine stemmed, similar to Mark. Um, I think it actually grows taller than Mark and it is slightly later flowering. So about six weeks later than what Mark is. Now cow power is the last one. Now cow power, I believe they actually don't have any seed of this left. I was just having a look at their website um, a couple of days ago. So cow power is actually sold not by a seed company, it's sort of private, by um, a guy up around Roma, I think he is. And um, that's actually from a selection of an old Desmanthus stand of which Mark was part of very originally. But over the 20 years, the um, it's sort of, yeah, they've sort of developed their own grazing tolerant ecotype, I suppose. It is a Vagardus um, and they've released it and it's called Cow Power. Now, um, I have, um, we have just recently released a prime fact on, on Desmanthus and there's a QR code um, in, the, um, in the handout that's been prepared. So if you're interested in more, more information on Desmanthus, then, um, then yeah, please, please use the QR code or go to the DPI website and um, Google the, the Desmanthus Prime Fact. All right, so do's and don'ts. My do's and don'ts of our good establishment persistence of Desmanthus. Um, for this environment, my suggestion is that you go for an early flowering variety. Don't stay away. Ask questions of, the, um, of whoever's providing you seed and just make sure that the components in the variety that you've got, make sure that it is short season. Otherwise, it might come up and look pretty, but it won't, it won't hang around because it, hasn't, it cannot flower um, in, in our environment because our season is so much shorter than what it is in Queensland. Make sure you scarify the seed. So ask your provider to, um, to make sure that it's scarified, ask for a seed certificate and make sure that the, um, the, germ, the germination of it is at least 50%, preferably 70. Now, um, so that means then that you've got plenty of seed to be, um, that's primed, ready to come up. And you, um, but you've also, part of the reason for um, aiming for around 50 to 70 is that you've then got that little bit of hard seed that already kickstarts your seed bank, um, ready to come up for the next year. So it's a bit of a hedge your bet type thing. But at the end of the day, if you're going to have a productive pasture, the best way to do it is to do your prior planning and preparation. And um, if you're going to have these guys in a mixture, then you don't have the opportunity for your pre-emergent herbicides. So it's really important that you do all that planning first, make sure your weeds are under control because you've got limited options when you've got a grass and a legume pasture. So if there's any doubt, my recommendation is to hold off for 12 months and manage your weeds for another 12 months because you know it's an expensive failure if you don't and if you don't and if it only if only comes up half-hearted and it's sort of a bit weak then you've got to manage it and baby it then for the next sort of 12 months two years do it right the first time tread it like a crop and um and you'll 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 be pleased with the outcome um, make sure you inoculate with the, rhizo with the specific rhizobia for Desmanthus. Now, um, yeah, so you may need to ask, may need to ask for that. Now I'm not, depending on where you are and, and up in Queensland, there is um, talk that if you're sowing 
this um, sowing desmanthus into paddocks or into areas where you've got Neptunia. So that's the, the plant that looks like this, um, but it's the sensitive one. So when you touch its leaves close up. So if you're in an area where you've got that, it seems to nodulate freely with the rhizobia that nodulates that. But the, the disadvantage of that is you don't know, it might be nodulating, but is it effective nodulation? Is it actually fixing the same amount of nitrogen? So to be perfectly honest, it's cheap insurance to make sure that it's inoculated, um, to give it the best, the best go. At the end of the day, you want this for animal production and also to provide nitrogen for your grass. So inoculation is cheap insurance. So your seed shallow, but if you're sowing your tropical grass, you'll be doing that um, anyway. So that, sh that should be fine. Um, it is, it is um, highly palatable and your stock will selectively graze it. So it's a good idea to rotation or graze it. It is, it is reported as being um, grazing tolerant, but um, nothing beats rotational grazing, um, high stock numbers, smash it down and then move them on onto your next paddock. That's the, the best way to be able to manage it. Um, allow it to set seed, you know, every one, two, three years. Again, depending on um, things. So probably at least every second year would be when you'd be wanting to allow it to do that. And that could be locking it up later in the growing season to, um, yeah, so, so then um, it actually, the seed, seed pods then get to maturity. But one of the, the things about, um, more Mark, Mark, I've noticed it in particular, is that it will just continue to grow after you've, um, after it has flowered. So you'll find it's got brown pods in it that, that stock really, won't really want to eat because by then it's actually quite hard and would, would not be very nice to eat. Um, but the, um, but the, the plant will still continue to grow. So once it's, once it's set seed and the pods are gone brown, you can just continue to graze. Uh, seedling regeneration is going to be important for the long-term persistence. So um, just keep in, keep in mind after a significant summer rainfall event, um, have a look and see whether you've got seedlings coming up. And they can often come up like hairs on a cat's back just because of the sheer, the, um, the sheer number of seeds that these guys can produce. So it might just be a case of pull your animals off, just give, it, give the, the new desmanthus um, a bit of a go um, and then come back in with your rotational grazing again. Again, just watching those seedlings, otherwise they'll be, they'll be pulled out. Um, the other thing that I've found, um, we have been able to kill desmanthus and I think part of the reason we were able to kill it was because we slashed it. We slashed it late in winter in preparation for spring so it was nice and tidy and we could actually sort of watch things come through. And I think that's actually been, been to the detriment of these plants. So because they're, they're so big, they're so woody, um, and then if you go and, well, not this one so much, this one hasn't been too bad, but anything that gets up big and woody, you know, the stems, stems can, can get, um, can, will get quite brittle over the winter because they're totally died. If you then come over it with a slasher, it sort of splinters the, the whole, splinters it all and can actually damage the crown. Which, um, which then allows, what, what I'm thinking is happening, it's, it's actually then allowing um, pathogens and things to get in and it's killing the plant. So um, slash it when it's green. Um, people up in Queensland are making hay and all sorts of things with it. Um, so yeah, so, so you can, you know, there are a range of uses that you can, can do with it, but um, it, our work would suggest not to slash it um, late winter. Alrighty. Um, that's probably me. I haven't, um, I haven't personally, we haven't um, here at Tamworth, we haven't tried either ray or cow power at this point. So I'm not in a position to be able to tell you which one, which one is the best. Um, but, but look, I think if you stick with those principles of um, short season and um, you should be, yeah, you should be pretty good. Are there any questions? Um, there are no animal health issues associated with, um, with desmanthus um, when it comes to insects. Insects, there is a psyllid um, which can cause a little bit of issue, but that tends to be over on the coast in high rainfall type environments. Um, it's not something we probably tend to see. Um, but the, uh, the other thing that, that, does ha um, that it is susceptible to is AMV, so alfalfa mosaic virus. So the same way as loosen a lot of our other pasture legumes and, and our crops, legume crops as well, um, it is susceptible to AMV. Um, now loosen, um, it's one of those very special legumes where um, it can be riddled with it, but you can't see it. It doesn't show any, any symptoms. And it, um, 
it doesn't show any symptoms and it and it doesn't seem to affect productivity but um, with desmanthus um, it is very very obvious the leaves become mottled yellow and it does seem to affect productivity um, we're actually currently uh, we're due to as soon as it stops raining and we can actually get onto our paddock um, we're pl actually planning on um, doing a screen of all the the varieties um, and so also some experimental lines of desmanthus to actually find out how widespread that um, susceptibility is across the germplasm that's available. We know that cultivar mark is susceptible, the other ones we're, we're not sure yet. Uh, just wondering about the um, gut microbe, where, where the research is up to on that, that leukaena with the, with the drench that you've got to give cattle? Uh, yeah, can, I'm happy to talk about Lakina. Can I just put that one at the end well, and just... Is it, is it? No, no, no. So, so this is Desmanthus. Um, that is Lakina. Um, so it uses the same rhizobia, so, sorry, inoculant. So rhizobia for nitrogen fixation. Um, that um, is actually a rumen bug that you need to put on Lakina. Um, and sorry, what was the question? Do so, so does Desmanthus require that? No, no, it doesn't. No, that's one of the great things about it as well is that... Um, look, if we, if we manage our desmanthus similar to what we do with our um, lucerne, as in, you know, rotationally graze it, you know, stock it hard, um, pull your animals off, um, um, with additional um, resting for regeneration and seed set, um, you know, and we even sow it similar to, to lucerne. So, yeah, so no, no, ros no gut rhizobia or anything, um, not rhizobia, um, gut microbe required um, for desmanthus. It's, it's good. Sue, so what sort of uh, ratio or rates per hectare in a blend with tropical grasses? So with your tropical grass, um, so uh, they talk about having sowing this at, uh, I think it's uh, two to three, up to four kilos per hectare, germinable seed. Now, mind you, if you've got 50% um, scarification or 50% germ after scarification, that means you need to double it. So that's two to, um, two to three, um, well, yeah. So um, germinable seed in a mixture and no sorry in a pure and you can cut it back down to about two in a mixture now with the grasses um it's it's actually it works with a number of different grasses um probably we've we've been sowing it with digit here and digit is actually quite competitive against it so um if you're going to sow it with a pure digit pure digit it's probably a good idea to cut your digit back down to say mm, half a kilo possibly something like that your, your rate of your digit grass, while um, where you've got, if you've got a mix which has got Bambatsi and um, and uh, Gatton and a few other things, I don't think Gatton and Bambatsi aren't quite as competitive because they don't set seed and regenerate anywhere near, well, they, they don't compare to what, um, sorry, to what digit does. So you can just sow it at your standard, you know, probably one, one kilo bare seed germinable. Or a fraction lower. Cal? Doesn't doesn't tolerate water logging. Yeah. Yeah, just wondering whether you'd be able to fit, say, something like arrowleaf clover in the system with it as well to grow through the winter. Or is it gonna run into each other's growing season too much? Um I think that is the case with tropicals and temperates anyway. Um so yes, um I think you I think you could. Um, again, um, using where's Sean Murphy using Sean's sort of uh, thinking. Um, you can only use your water once. So if the legume, so by the end of, end of the, um, so by autumn, your soil water is basically zilch because the grass and the legume will have used it all, um, which is going to restrict your, your temperate annual legume. And then, so let's say the legume gets going, if it's swamped, if there's a lot of growth on it, say what we've had this winter, um, then that's also going to restrict that. But, um, but there's no reason why it couldn't work. Um, we certainly haven't done any work on that to see whether there's any effect of smothering.